Zach Toohey coming up in part two. You can forward on there now if you want and miss us. <laughs> uh, I advise you not to forward ahead. Um, listen to the whole show, obviously. But he just survived an earthquake in Melbourne on Tuesday and we talked to him um, a lot about what his plans are and, you know, that very disappointing loss to Melbourne um, last weekend. On to GEA, lads, is... There's a lot of games on this weekend. Uh, the games on TV now. You, you, Tipperary are featuring uh, heavily. Boris Lee versus Nina, Nina Aroges on TG Cahar at 3.45. We know Brendan Maher, Dan McCormack, our own Paddy Stapleton with Boris Lee. This is a knockout game, right? Yeah, so this is the group of death, Woolly, and that was you could see that from the outset in Tipperary. The four North Tipperary teams, they know each other very well. Um, Boris Lee, are, they, they had a great game with Killer One last week. So they'll probably be coming coming into this game as slight favourites head of Nina who haven't really hit the heights this year but it should be a tight game nonetheless as you said there's the two ca- the county boys Bursa Lee there's Barry Heffern and Jake Morris boys to look out for but there's a young lad from Bursa Lee who's lighting up the Tipperary Championship and that's Eddie Ryan he's only 17 years of age and he's been scoring all around him scored I think it was 10 points against us when we played them. So he's definitely one to look out for this weekend. And who's the young lad they had to look out for that was in the leave and cert when they won the Munster that time? He's not the young lad anymore. They've another young lad yeah, here. Yeah, they've, they've three really young lads who are really impressed in the Tipperary Championship. It's Kevin Maher. James Devaney is the man Devaney, you're thinking yeah. about. JD with the nickname. But um, yeah, Eddie Ryan has, I'd say, been their most impressive forward this year. He scored 10 points last week and he's just, he's definitely one to, to watch this weekend. Right, okay. The other one on TG Cahar is Briefy. Brafey versus the Neil. Brafey obviously have the O'Shea's. Um, Aidan and Connor now. Uh, Seamus isn't playing, I don't think, club anymore. Rob Henley and Matthew Ryan look really strong. Uh, the Neil have Tommy Conroy. So it's interesting. I'll be watching this. And always interesting, Lee, to see how the county boys come back and they play against each other from being, you know, band of brothers, as they all like to call it. And now they're, they have to be enemies. I thought it was funny, Niall Morgan saying that uh, Con Kilpatrick and Brian Kennedy marked each other in the league game. And let's just say they were test- testing each other a week after winning an All-Ireland together. It's always an interesting dynamic. Yeah, and they actually won the All-Ireland together. So, I mean, Mayo lost one together. So, who knows? You know, this could bring to the front about who blames who and stuff. <laughs> um but uh, yeah, briefly they got uh, four of the county players. And they're going to be coming up against um, Tommy Connery. Uh, it's a really interesting match. I think it's at two o'clock on TG Cahar. Um, they're sort of the uh, the Mayo of Mayo club teams, aren't yeah. they? You know, they've been in four finals I think since 2013, and they were finalists again last year. I mean, you start to wonder how much heartbreak the O'Shea's can really take at this stage. But uh, you know, they go again, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I like. I mean, if this was Tyrone Club football, Tommy Conroy would be saying to Rob Henley, "You should have, shouldn't have came for that ball with McShane. What were you doing?" <laughs> that kind of trash talking would definitely be going on. One other big one in Tipperary, uh, Niall, is J.K. Brackens versus Lockmore. Lockmore could go out as well. There's a lot in a lot of counties. There's matches that don't have that much importance. In Tipperary at the moment, even though you're not at semi-final stage, there's a lot of importance on these ones. Yeah, the group stages have been very tight so far, Woolly, and none more so than this group. I mean, Kiladanian, they beat Lockmore in the first round, similar like they beat them in the county final last year yeah. as well. So that was obviously a tough one to take for Lockmore. But this should be a great game. I mean, J.K. Brackens, they'd be kind of... Lockmore are, say, five years down the road from where J.K. Brackens want to be right. in terms of they're a dual club as well. They were beaten in the football final two years ago. But like they're, they're a very young team and they've been coming the last few years. But I suppose they're probably, they lost by a point to Kiladanian last week. So this, like, this is a straight knockout game. They drew 10 all in the football last weekend. So there's a bit of, there's a healthy right. rivalry going between them there. The, the, the J.K. Brackens lads would have went to school um, in Templemore with the Lockmore boys like I know Brian McGrath he would have won a, a hearty cup and a crow cup playing alongside Paddy Cadell from J.K. Brackens like. so right. there's, they're close together and it should be it should be a good game like. Yeah that must have been a difficult decision for T.G. Catter which one of those Tipperary hurling matches um, to put on the television big one up in Derry Lee is Swatraw versus Slock Neil now in this group this is in a group nobody goes out of this but it's still an interesting game what kind of makes it interesting is Swatraw have the return of Anton Tohill. He came back from the AFL, um, Lee. I very, I was very surprised at this because I missed this news. He, The last video I saw of him, he was breaking down crying because he was getting picked for his uh, for his debut. So I was kind of had him written off kind of, you know, to stay. But as, as it turns out, he's home playing. He'll be probably midfield for Swatra. 
Yeah, he's home, so he is. Um, I think it's his studies in the end that that have got him home. So he was offered a place at Queen's University to study uh, medicine, and you can only keep them offers for so many years. So I think the plan was always to go to Australia, experience that, experience professional football, um, up until the point where that offer is just about to expire, and then come home and uh, and do his studies. So maybe that's why he was so emotional when he got his debut. He knew maybe that there was sort of a ticking clock, and he, and he really wanted to get it done. Uh, before he went home. In terms of him slotting back into the Swatcher team, you'd have to say that he would. Um, so this group stage that Derry are doing at the minute, this this weekend will be the, the last week of it. Uh, if you finish top in the group, then you finish, or you play against someone who finished fourth in another group in the quarterfinals. If you finish second, you play someone who finished third in another group. So it's all about seeding and just seeing whereabouts you'll be. Uh, they're going to be up against Slot Neil. And because it's not a knockout, I mean, You'd want to see Anton Toho just go straight back in. You imagine midfield, high fashion, just like his dad. It's exciting stuff. Like, I mean, and really good news for Derry as well. Well, that's the thing. Really good news for Derry. Like, you'll have Toho and Connor Glass in midfield. You can put Emmett Bradley at centre half forward, who's very, very good there. Maybe Niall Lachlan in full forward line with Shane McGuigan. If you get Young Brown back from the AFL, he's your last fella that you need to bring back here, um, Lee. Well, you're not a you're not a Derry man. You've obviously played your club football there. But like you know a lot about Derry football. But at the same time, if they get back, not if you get back, if they get um, him back, because he was a brilliant miner in the full, in the full, as a full forward, Jesus, Derry are looking pretty strong. Yeah, I mean, they're looking at a really formidable outfit already. Um, Rory Geller, he's given them structure and he's given them purpose and he's given them, you know, he's changed the culture there. Now, it's a really proud thing to play for your county. Not that it wasn't proud before, but there was always that thing with club football in Derry where it was just so important that playing county, you would have been seen as sacrificing your club football. Um, and the championship's wide open at the minute. Like, who knows who else can pop up? Uh, we haven't even mentioned Glenn. They've got so many of the the actual Derry players on it, you know, the Bradleys and McFall and everyone else. I mean, it, it, it's really wide open and the more competitive the club football is, you can only imagine that, I mean, the stronger the county will be next year. Yeah, exactly. The other big one, um, which is a knockout, Waterford are doing really well to be at semi-final stage, Mount Sion and Ballygunner. Now, this is a huge game when I was in my early 20s, whether it's a huge game now, you know, Ballygunner just dominating. Like, I, Austin Gleeson's nearly the only Mount Sion player I know. You know, they're kind of gone through a... It, it, on paper, it looks great, and historically, it looks great. Uh, Niall Porrick Mahoney, obviously, back for Ballygunner. So, like, I mean, that's somebody to at least uh, keep your eye for. He, he, I think he got 1-9 the last time. Yeah, I think it's similar to um, Wexford and Carlo. The Waterford are running off the Hurling Championship first. So ah, it's, right. um, it's working out well for them that way. But yeah, Ballygunner, they're going for their 42nd win in a row, I think it is, this weekend. Like, um, Mount Sinai will be doing well to put it up to them. Like, Yeah, no, they definitely will. It's interesting with Wexford as well, because they said last year, poor Davy got all the blame for putting the hurling first and then the football, because everyone was saying that Davy, this was, you know, Davy pulling old strokes that he'd have all the hurlers back. But sure, all the hurlers play football, so he didn't actually get any of them back. I interviewed Davy, But I remember, I think the Wexford County Board were saying, ah, oh, we're going to alternate it every year, so the football will be first next year. There's a football first ne- next in none of these count- in these kind of traditional hurling counties. Yeah, the hurling counties kind of seem to... You know who a hurling county is anyway when you see what way they're running it off first. Yeah, it? yeah, for sure. One other thing is Tyg de Burke is obviously going to be back. I think it's October. He's looking towards... Uh, a return for his club and then you're looking at Parik Mahoney back Tyg de Burka back you have young Ky- Michael Kiley who's going to be a year older he's probably a guaranteed starter you're looking at a forward line of young Michael Kiley Austin Gleeson Parik Mahoney Desi Hutchinson and the two Bennets that's a sensational forward line Jamie Barron in midfield Caelan Lyons Tyg de Burka Irla Daly in the half back line um, and Conor Gleeson and, and Conor Prumpty in the full back line like Waterford this is a sensational team and it's a big team too it's easy to see why Liam Cahill it went is. back to Waterford. Like I know, I'd say it was obviously a very tough decision for him to sort of turn down his own county. But like when you see that team, and like when you see like Tyg de Burke come back, he'll be such a key player for them. They can kind of free up Irla Daly on the wing, and it just gives them more options to kind of play around with. Maybe you could put Shane Bennett back in the forward. So they just they they really do. They've got so much strength and depth. Like lads like Peter Hogan, we haven't even mentioned him or Jack Prendergast. All these yeah, lads Montgomery who impressed this year as well. Like so, yeah, that's De- why Liam Cahill went back. Yeah. So it's no. This is no surprise that he didn't want the tip job. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be staying with Waterford if I was him. Come here. I have to talk to you about this, lads, because you're both togging out. I'm togging out myself. I played junior B this year and an intermediate game that I don't want to talk about ever again for the rest of my life. But 
The dressing rooms are reopened. This is from three days ago, from September the 20th. And you would have thought with our progression of vaccinations and where we are now, like you can go into a bloody pub, right? Indoors, you know, and you're looking at a situation where you're going into a dressing room. Dressing rooms are finally open after being locked all summer. And it's a pain in the arse, lads. I've done it. Like, I mean, you're talking out in the side of a pitch. It's not good. You're doing a, you're doing a piss in the bushes beside it. You know, it's just not an ideal situation. So they've opened up the dressing rooms, uh, uh, Niall, and they've opened up to six people at a time. What's the point of it? They might as well be closed. Yeah, like it's just, I, I suppose we've got into the routine of people go to train and togged out now and you just, you come in your car and you're ready to go. I know there's a few lads, it's a big, like some lads just like to sit in the dressing room, you know, kind of psych themselves up and yeah. get going for training. I don't find it too much of an inconvenience before training. It's just after training, you, you're usually you're having a bit of a crack in the dressing room. You'd be having the protein mix. You'd be boys having the showers. And everyone's just in a bit of a buzz. You'd miss that. But the biggest loss of all is the dressing room on match day, I think, because the whole thing is just, it's very kind of haphazard these days. Lads are just kind of streaming up to the stands and the manager's trying to give his team talk while there's supporters coming in beside him. Like, yeah. And it's just not an ideal scenario. The same again at half time and the supporters around generally when you're giving your, your team talk. It's just, oh, it's, it's hard to credit really. Yeah, it's disappointing really. You wonder where they pulled number the six out of, you know, rather than eight or rather than nine mm-hmm. or, you know, like, I mean, there was some fella joking with me on Twitter saying that you're going to have to announce the team, Lee, in installments, in sixes. So you'll announce the goal, <laughs> goalie and five backs, go in there and talk. <laughs> like, it's just like, is it even worth opening them? Maybe for showers afterwards, uh, Lee, you'll head in six and you know that want to shower that's the only kind of benefit i can see from it yeah i mean you'll find out who really uh takes the longest with their hair routine and stuff as well what group comes out the longest um but no it doesn't really make any sense to me um uh, like we you'd show up to the match maybe four or five of you bundled in the car but you can't actually be in an open space changing room together i mean uh we've been getting changed just in the opposition sub bench or your own sub bench um, and that's what we have to do. And I've got into this awful habit. It's it's hardly a third world problem, but I always leave my changing my boots really quickly to get into the warm up because I'm always late. And I leave my trainers out and they get soaked every single time. And it just it's it's got to a point I'm just really fed up with it. But um it's it's actually the the ladies that I feel really sorry for in particular. I mean, I manage the ladies team at uh, East Belfast, the senior team, and like they come from work and they have to get changed in the car, in a public car park, yeah. you know, just to go in, out into training, and they've got, you know, problems, obviously. Uh, and down, they play matches at 7 p.m. on a Saturday, and obviously everything's on on a Saturday, like weddings and birthdays and all the rest of it. So all the committed ones who are coming to the match and then heading to there, you know, they're in real awkward situations where, you know, with, with their hair and everything else and all the obvious things, but it's a real pain, and it's a problem in retaining numbers and getting them out and stuff. And I don't know, like, I mean, six, it just seems a random number, and... Uh, they're better just keeping them closed at this stage. Well, that's the thing. If you had a, something to go on to afterwards and you're stinking after training and you've got no option, you know, but to drive home wherever you live. It's just, it's very, very, I'm very disappointed at the GEA. Nobody would say anything if they just opened the dress rooms. Like, it's not like the public would go against them for just opening up the bloody dressing rooms at this stage. So six is just, it's just very, very disappointing. Um, one other bit of news about what the GEA are going to do here. Um, Lee, I'll come to you on this. It, they're, they're going to take control of inter-county team announcements. So we know as it stands now at 9 a.m. on a Thursday, the county has to release their team and substitutions to Croke Park for the programme. And uh, usually what counties are doing is they're sending them into Croke Park, but they're asking Croke Park, don't uh, don't say anything about that. We want to do our own announcement. You know the way their, their own Twitter accounts now are doing fancy announcements of the teams and um, whatever they want to do. Often when they do announce them, the counties later on that evening or the next day, sometimes not till the Saturday night, they don't include the substitution. So the GE want to take control of this. It looks like they're going to and just take a lot of that messing away um, from the from the county boards. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much of it's really going to change, though. Or, or do, will they announce them earlier? And the, is it not up to the county's actually discretion about what gets named and what doesn't? Um, they can be a bit of a farce anyway. Like We all know the team that's named on the the day before, whatever it is, isn't always the team that's actually lined out. I mean, if you even go back to, was it 2011, uh, the Kildare and Donegal game where Michael Murphy, everyone knew that he was injured, absolutely everyone. Um, but Jim McGuinness, you know, he held it right to the very end. I think he did his, his, the parade walk and everything just, just to keep up the farce off it and everything. Um, so, I mean, I don't know uh, 
how important they even are. But I, I don't, does it change too much? It probably doesn't change too much. You know, it's just that 24 hours they're going to announce it before. Um, and it, it doesn't change the fact that that can be a, a, a it doesn't have to be the real team now. Like Lee said, you have to give the real team 20 minutes yeah. before throw in. And that's when you have um, Alan Milton running around the press box in Crow Park. He's in for him or he's, you know, and you actually yeah. get the real team. So it's not really even fixing that. Yeah, well, the one good thing it's going to cut out, I think, is the the teams that are named with no subs. I found that was the most annoying thing of all because, like, when you're from a county, like, you know, there's like 40 lads in a the panel these days. So yeah. you want to see who's in the subs to see who's going well in training, who's going well here and there. But, like, even when they just give 15, sure, like, you don't know, uh, you don't have an idea who could be starting because the 15 mightn't be starting at all. Yeah. Because you don't know who, who could be replacing them. Uh, especially now the 26 is what everyone, t- all the players talk about. Exactly. Bernard Brogan might not be in the 26. You know, he was delighted in his last ever game for Dublin just to get into the 26 to replay against Kerry. Yeah, so, like, at least it will cut out that, like, people will know who the subs are. But at the same time, I still think we'll see plenty of dummy teams and it's not going to make too much of a difference. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it'll make too much of a difference. Liam Ryan has been talking about Darry Egan. Liam Ryan, the postman. Liam, the postman Ryan. I didn't realise Liam Ryan, uh, his nickname was the postman. And it's not because he always delivers. He does always <laughs> deliver. He is a, po- he's a postman. He's been talking about Darry Egan taking over uh, Wexford. Darry Egan, obviously, very highly rated. He's Kiladangan coming up through the ranks with them. Um... Like, what can we expect from Wexford under under Darry Egan, Niall? Like, I mean, the sweeper will be... Kevin Foley will be wing-back, you know? Like, I mean, that sweeper will be gone, or is he f- tactical, flexible tactically? Well, I can't make any guarantees, Woolly. Like, he... I suppose Darry Egan, like, while he has a wealth of experience as a player, he hasn't too much experience as a manager. Like, he's he's been involved with Tipperary GA in some capacity, I'd say, for the last nearly 15 years. Like, from when he started playing... He was on the minor team in goals when Shane Long was on the team in 2003. He was out the field the next year. And then he was on to the under-21s and made the senior team too. And even won an All-Ireland medal in 2010. He was a good footballer too, no? Yeah, I, I actually hadn't known much about that at all. Maybe it's just because we only talk about hurling <laughs> tip. Or tip. We didn't give him the credit for it. But um, I just know from playing against... We played against Kiladanyan a few times and he used to play centre-forward. And um, he was just so clever. The type of player, he mightn't touch the ball, but he'd always... He'd always Tap o- be in the right position to tap over a point right. and um, like we used to play against Kiladanian underage and we'd have been sort of a similar enough level but that was when Dara Egan went in kind of as he took over the coach in the underage in Kiladanian and now that team that we used to play against is five or six of them on the Tipperary senior panel like and he's credit he's given a lot of the credit for sort of getting Kiladanian going and now like in all grades they nearly are the the most consistent and the best club in Tipperary, like so. Right. That says a lot about him too. So he's he doesn't he doesn't have much managerial experience then, other than a bit of underage. It's more he wasn't coaching. really like yeah, like he was in with Liam Sheedy, as you know, as yeah. in a like a coaching or a selector kind of capacity. And I think the the only team that I'm aware that he really managed was Tipperary under sixteen teams a few years ago. But like he's a primary school principal as well, so he'll. Um, He'll have good organisational skills. I'm sure it'll be no bother to him. Like he's still a very young man too, so I suppose it's a it's a good place to start for him anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the Mayo County Board released a statement here, um, lads. So they said this is about <laughs> after they lost the All Ireland, they took some um, heat. Let's just say online. Um, mostly on Twitter and Facebook they're the most kind of toxic Instagram they'll say great game well done such a positive lovely place Um, (laughs) yeah yeah well done loads of likes and (laughs) and all that kind of thing but the the Twitter and the Facebook are the most toxic um, of the social media platforms so they said constructive criticism forms part of the narrative of our games however unfortunately over the last few days there's been a number of personal attacks on both players and team management that are completely unnecessary and accept- unacceptable to all involved with Mayo GEA. So I presume they're talking about supporters here, Lee. Like, Joe Brawley's getting a bit of heat. He wrote a fairly scathing article the day after the All-Ireland Final in the Sunday Independent, um, referenced Aidan O'Shea, which is a, uh, like, it's, it's, not u- it's not unusual for him to target Aidan O'Shea. He wrote a piece almost dedicated to, to him the week before. He criticised... Um, he criticised James Horan saying the manager talks a good game but it's merely talk when there are individuals who are undroppable and a manager has favourites clicks form and it's not a team. I don't know where he's getting this information uh, from Lee and uh, like are the Mayo County Board you think talking about him because I don't see any other pundits being unduly unfair to them. Um, you know Mayo usually get very positive press. Maybe they're talking about online you know just random supporters. 
Yeah, I mean, it's because they're so vague about it, it's hard to address it. You know, I mean, you, you're saying stop, but you're not saying who stops, you know. I mean, yeah. I just feel like if Joe Brawley's going to call out Aidan O'Shea and whatever else, and then the May, a Mayo County Board are coming to his defence and to Mayo's defence, and you got to call out him and say, you know, that it's not right or uh, that article in particular or this phrase in particular is too far or whatever it may be. Um, I mean, Mayo supporters in general are usually a positive uh, group. Like, I mean, you have to be, don't you? I mean, every year to come back and, and get all the way to the final and, and get your hopes up again or whatever else. But, I mean, it's, it's not the first time it's happened either. I think back, was it 2003, Kieran McDonald, uh, Mayo against Fermanagh, he was getting abused from the fans and he just left the panel over the head of it. Um, I think they were targeting um, his sister and things like that. And, you know, I'm doing lots of impersonal things. And so he took it upon himself to leave. And I don't even know whether that was after the match or during the match if he heard things. So you don't know who comes up to players in the streets and stuff afterwards or maybe during club games and things. But, I mean, I just think if you're going to be vague in your response, then there's nothing, no one can really do anything. You can't come up with a solution. Yeah, I don't even know where the Mayo fans, I know Aidan O'Shea took a lot of heat. Um, he was trending on Twitter for a couple of days, but Dublin fans hate him. I think they were more outside of Mayo fans saying, oh, he can't do it on the big day type of thing, Niall, rather than, you know, specifically Mayo fans turning on their team. Yeah, well, like, I was thinking about this and the only thing I could compare it to is, like, if I wrote an article online that didn't go down too well and, like, you'd have people maybe giving out to you on Twitter or people tagging you and stuff like this. And for me, if someone makes a good point when they're maybe criticising you, you'd take it on board and you'd be like, right, I should have done better here. But if someone goes off ranting and raving with the type of abuse that people give out the most about these days, you just laugh at it. And you just, like, it's just like water off a duck's back. Like, and I'd say that's the way it is. Like, just say, as you said, if it's coming from Dublin fans, you know, kind of just jeering at him. Like, he won't, like, his, harsh, his harshest critic will be himself. Yeah. Like, he won't pay any attention to anything like that coming from, from other people. Like, so I just think, you know, sometimes it's a bit too much made of, of that. Like, I th- Well, Larry, the, the GA president, Larry McCarthy, now bear in mind, he's just opened up dressing rooms to six people. He's more important things to be worried about. But he's chimed in on this. Words matter, was what the GA president said. What one says matters. What one puts into public domain matters. Yeah, I'd agree with the last part. But words matter. Like, I mean, you know, I don't know, he's gone almost like Ellen DeGeneres, like be kind, like this is an all Ireland final and some, like how can you stop supporters at a match shouting in abuse of players? You can't, you just tell players you have to deal with that, that you're in the public eye, some supporters will throw in abuse at you and nobody ever talks about how do we stop, you know, play, yeah. supporters from shouting in, cop on, you're no good. Social media, my advice to people, and I've been on the receiving end of, of some terrible stuff on social media, I just went off it. I stopped looking at it. I went off. It was the time of that Eddie Brennan uh, interview was the worst I've ever gotten. And I just I just didn't turn it on. So I missed most of the stuff. I can only imagine what was going on. But but I know by flicking in the odd time into my mentions, there was 20 notifications. And then I just go out until when I flicked in, there was nothing. Like it, it, You know, the fire had gone out. Like I would say Aidan O'Shea Lee played that game, realised it didn't go well for him in the second half, um, went out with the lads. I'd say he went out with the lads the next day. And he could even have gone out with the lads the next day. And by the time he might have gone back online, all that stuff would have gone. And he's done interviews as well saying, I know I'm not everyone's cup of tea and there's people that don't like me. Are, are people getting all offended and upset for Aidan O'Shea? When Aidan O'Shea, you don't hear Aidan O'Shea ever complaining about it. I mean, it's not the nudie Aidan O'Shea. He's maybe the easiest target at this stage. You know, he's such a go-to thing. Um, you talk a little about Joe Brawley getting after him. I, I never really see... I was saying this to Niall beforehand. I never really see Joe Brawley saying anything that's too bad about Aidan O'Shea, but it's just the volume of it. He just throws in the name every now and again, yeah, yeah. every article, because he's he's a big name, and then Joe Brawley loves attention, so you put the big name in the column, and then that'll, that creates controversy and, and gets what he wants. Um, but I, I mean, I don't think it bothers Aidan O'Shea at all, to be honest, because he keeps coming back for more. Um, I think he got criticised because he did that. He was sort of sponsored by... Um, a mobile repair company yeah. and then it showed him at the beach and he was in his swimming trunks and it was a bit Baywatch sort of looking like um, I mean he would have known the abuse before he did that but he obviously doesn't care yeah, we see the, here, here's the thing I was thinking about that like I mean there's no way I would have done that and that came out after the Dublin game 
we don't necessarily know did Aidan tell them look I'll do this but it has to come out after the all earn final and maybe you know it, it, they put it out too soon like when you don't know the ins yeah. and outs of things it's difficult I remember talking to Niall Morgan on Monday when I was giving out about him against Monaghan I was saying where's this lad going his bloody head is gone up there he was he didn't want to be up there you know like there there can there could be a story why that came out it's definitely if that if Aidan knew that kind of coming out of the sea in the Baywatch uh, shorts, putting his hands through his hair. If he knew that was coming out before the all-or, potential all and final, I'd be very dis- I'd be very surprised at him for doing that. Well, I, I do know because um, the, that same mobile repair company, they came to me offering Aidan O'Shea an interview, as long as I mentioned the, the, the mobile and whatever, and right. they sent me them exact same photos. Now, this was before... It was before Dublin played Kildare because I had already asked him a question about... Um, you know, are you preparing for Dublin in the semi-final? And he said, well, we don't know who we're going to play yet because Kildare, Kildare could beat them. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, right. So, he, so he, did that, <laughs> um, he, did, he did that way yeah, the back photos in the and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I had the photos and all the photos are in the article that I put in with the interviews with him. So they just resurfaced again, you know, once he, the all Ireland final came about. Okay. It's, you know, it's easy to do. Now, the mobile company might have done that too because... If, well, if they're smart, you know, I mean, he's going to be at the center of attention. Yeah. Throw your name into the mix of it and use the most of that sponsorship. But in fairness, to Indonesia, like for a fact, he, he did that. It was before the the Dublin Kildare game for sure. Right, right. OK, I'm sure he didn't want it resurfacing at the time, but you can understand the mobile company yeah. when that's when his profile is highest. Mm. Unfortunate, unfortunate for him. But like, I mean, just to go back to Larry McCarthy, how do you stop this? Like for Larry McCarthy to come out and say words matter, you know, you think a fellow who goes online uh, I don't want to say a Dublin fan, a fan from anywhere that's not from me. It doesn't like Aidan O'Shea might go, oh, geez, I'm, just, I'm going to give Aidan O'Shea a bit of abuse. Oh, hang on a second. Larry McCarthy actually said that words matter. I better not do this. It's total nonsense. It's bluff. It's, it's making, I, I think Larry McCarthy has more important things to worry about. And number two, if Larry McCarthy he says, stop unwarranted, unwarranted critiques of GA members, who's going, like, who's going to listen to that and stop doing it? How about bringing in some sort of a direction to clubs, if you see a member online go crossing the line, that that's a, a, a six-month suspension. Wouldn't that be something tangible that the, the GA president could come out and say without saying words matter? That word, that Those two <coughs> words don't matter, Larry. It's, like, it's obviously at a much larger scale, but you see it in the Premier League and in soccer that oftentimes if there's fans that get involved in such abuse they're called out and they're banned from their club's ground and stuff like that. The GA is at a smaller scale, so it should be a little bit easier to police. Yeah. And it would obviously make a lot much more of a difference if Larry McCarthy was to introduce some sort of, a, you know, a criteria to ban someone if they come out with that sort of thing, yeah. rather than just saying words matter. Yeah, exactly. I think that might be something to make. I don't see it stopping. The rest that aren't GA members then, Lee, obviously that might deter them if there was some sort of a, you know, a, a suspension or something like that, or they, they had to be held accountable for what they're writing online, especially after matches about other GA members. The other stuff, the, the, the people who are throwing abuse online that aren't GA members, like telling them words matter means nothing. You just have to tell players, don't go on it. Stay away from it for a few yeah. days. And, you know, just, just for your own uh, peace of mind and mental health, just don't be on that, those stupid apps, especially after losing a match. Yeah, well, sports ecology is a really big thing, especially in the county setup now. So for all we know, they do have people sort of dealing with that and sort of identifying the difference between uh, a fan who's given constructive criticism and a troll. You know, these, these Twitter accounts, they don't even have profile pictures. They've got nine followers um, and they're just hurling abuse and you don't actually know who they are and they're deliberately being as abusive as they can be without actually even meaning it themselves. And um, so maybe the players are being prepared like that. But in terms of Laurie's case, I mean, it's just a tick box and exercise, isn't it? We have to be seen to be against this. And therefore I'm doing everything I can do. And it's not my fault if I can't control everybody. But like it's like you say, introducing bans or threatening and or to, to ban players from their clubs or, or fans from their clubs and stuff. And that just makes sense. That is what the Premier League have been doing. They were very slow to doing it, especially in terms of racism. Um, and they're only sort of catching up with it now. And then I think it was after the England game in the Euros. So many fans got arrested for their online abuse. And, and like it has, there's been a dip in it, you know, because 
uh, there's now a consequence so people are afraid of it so now they don't do it and, and that's that's what the GA need to do and Niall's absolutely right it's on a much smaller scale and it can be much easier policed um, actually do something about it yeah I mean words matter that's 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 one of the worst I've ever heard yeah it means it means absolutely nothing I miss this one um, Niall Peter Casey he did his cruise shit in the all Ireland final like I mean the, uh, I feel terrible for him his older brother Mike is only coming back from one um, he's after scoring five points in about 24 or 25 minutes. He's flying it. What, it. what was interesting about it is he almost tried to run this off. Like, and cruciate injuries, the weirdest injuries, in that they're probably the most severe injury you can get on a field. Worse than a leg break, even. It mm. just takes so long in the rehab. But when you do them, so you can jog away on it. I know, like, I, I've even heard of a lad who done his cruciate and he ended up finishing the game, playing a second half of football with the cruciate gone. I suppose, and it's weird, it can affect different people differently, like other yeah. people are gone straight away and they're not even able to walk off pitch. But it depends, like, there's two cruciates, I think, there's an anterior and an interior one, yeah. something like that, one is worse than the other. Yeah, well, you never want to hear any of those words anyway. No. But, um, yeah, Peter Casey, like, he's going to be just a huge loss for Limerick um, next year because I think it was 15 points he scored between every game this year but he, he, he looked like a man who was going to score a few more in the All-Ireland final like he's just I thought he, he was nearly he was one of Limerick's best forwards this year and that every time he got the ball there just looked to be like a, there was a score on he was either beating his man like he must be such a nightmare for a defender to mark how fast he is with those feet and everything so he's he's going to be a huge loss and you would feel for him um, I suppose as a Limerick, like Limerick, they'll be thinking who who's going to come in to replace, who's going to take his spot now. And like I suppose Graham Mulcahy has been there, but I'd say I I think this could be the year for Pat Ryan to to step up and really, it. yeah. Mulcahy like, doesn't look to be moving like he used to. He's only no. thirty one, but he looks older than thirty one. Yeah, like he's been on the team for a long, a, time. a long time. Like I remember yeah. going to tip games back around 2012, 13 and. It was Graham Mulcahy and Sean Tobin, and they were the main men inside for Limerick. Like he's probably been there the longest, I'd say, himself and Declan Hannan, even though he's a young man too from the current team. But um, yeah, he hasn't hurled as well. Like he had a brilliant year in 2018 when they first yeah. won the All Ireland. But I remember in 2020, like he was taken off in the semi final scoreless, and the same in the final. Like so, and that's why he wasn't on the team this year. So it hasn't been going as well for them. So there's, there's an opening there for the likes of Pat Ryan. Um, and see see if he can take it like yeah exactly one other thing on that Cahill O'Neill he obviously got he kind of got shafted with his debut being away to, I think it was away to Galway and yeah. he didn't he didn't play well um, he didn't really see much much after that I suppose an opportunity for him as well yeah exactly like he was he was very good again for the Limerick under 20s like so he's he looks like a very bright talent for the future and definitely like it's it's tough like I suppose coming in one game only getting a half a hurling like you know anyone can struggle in a place like that like and the Limerick management they won't be reading Anton into that like he'll get another chance and the way he's going he looks like a man who, who'll take his chance Yeah but uh, by all accounts Kieran MacDonald uh, is being reported I think it's Midwest Radio Lee that he's got like that he's gone out of the management team now the Mayo County Board didn't confirm that he was gone but they didn't deny that he was gone either and I suppose maybe they need a bit of time after a loss you know to digest it and um, you know think about what their plans are it'll be interesting if he's gone because like I hate I hate kind of analysing rumours because it might be might turn out that he wouldn't be gone. But I suppose one of the big the one of the big criticisms of Mayo in the final was that their kicking game wasn't great, their use of Aidan O'Shea wasn't great. Um and I suppose if you're looking at uh, Kieran McDonald as a player, they're definitely two things that he would maybe if you if you're judging his coaching on how he played, maybe they're two things that he would have liked to have seen more of or that he didn't have a, enough input like you know we, we know James Horan loves a running game because when Stephen Rochford took over Mayo back in 2016 he tried to develop a, a, a more obvious kicking game and they actually weren't getting very much success out of it until Andy Moran um, got the full forward jersey and his movement you know they, they built their kicking game around him showing for the ball all the time and they, Andy Moran transformed Stephen Rochford's um, fortune so like I mean the reason I'm talking about Stephen Rochford is because he tried to change them from being a James Horan running team to more of a kicking team and now they're back with James Horan with their, their running game probably their biggest strength um, and I don't know I'm only trying to read between the lines of Kieran McDonald is gone maybe that could be his frustration yeah, I mean, like if, if you are looking at a player and basing it on that, but I mean, it, it's not always the case if you look at former players compared to 
with their managerial careers, like so someone like like Rory Gallagher, you know, he'd be a forward for from or he was a forward for Fermanagh, you know, a really high scoring forward, a star. I love getting the ball kicked into him. He's a great example. Um, yeah. Then you look at him as a manager, <laughs> you know, you don't get more uh, polar opposite in that sense, especially when he was the manager of Fermanagh. He was very uh, conservative and defensive. Um, so you never know. Like I mean, sometimes they go the other way when they become coaches and managers. But yeah, I mean, Kieran McDonnell, he was always. Uh, he always did what he liked, didn't he? I mean, he and he was um, he loved he thrived in the chaos and stuff. So uh, you, you would imagine if he was if he had more input in that, it, w- it would be a kicking game. But like in terms of see, I, I think Mayo's a really really big problem this year with Mayo was the fact that they weren't playing Division One football. I think that really hampered them because so they're playing this running game and it's working so well when you're playing you know like Leitrim and everyone else in, in the weaker sort of Connacht Championship and then against these these teams that can't really match up in the same extent. When you, If you compare it to Tyrone, who, for example, they were trying a kicking game. They were being really adventurous going forward. They went up to Killarney and they didn't even play a sweeper. And then they got an absolute tanking. You know, so because they were playing better opposition, um, they were asking questions of them, sort of revealing the weaknesses in the team and what systems work and what don't. And then they're able to plug them holes going forward. And um, Mio couldn't do that this year, you know, with that. So I don't know, I mean... In terms of Wake Kieran McDonald, I really hope he hasn't left because I love watching him in the warm ups. You know, you just urging him. He's ever the Mayo players are warm up and you're urging him, he's gonna do I'd say the left and he does it every single time and it always goes over and and it's uh, it's just a sight to behold. Uh, he was a brilliant, he was absolutely brilliant player. I did notice him. I said this up in Eden Dark at the live show. I've noticed him at a couple of games. He's excitable on the sideline. And Horan's Horan's not, and there's been some criticisms of Horan down through the years of selectors leaving because Kind of now, I'm not criticizing James Horns for this. James Horns' neck is on the line rather than his selectors. If I was managing an intercounty team, I wouldn't have selectors, I'd have a coach. I'm not going to have someone telling me what to do. It's all right for you, buddy. You'll sit back down to stand. I'm the one whose neck is on the block, and I want now if they can, they can give you their ideas, but like, I mean, you can go away, you know, don't stop, stop trying to confuse me here. But I saw McDonald running down to him a few times at different times of, of the semi final and the final, and Horn would lend him his ear because they get on well. Mm. And I didn't see Horan acting on anything now. Horan just kind of would turn around and he'd just walk away. And I'd be watching Horan to make, is he, is he going to act on what McDonald said? Uh-uh. <laughs> like he wasn't really. Again, I'm not really criticising James for this either. Mm. James Horan's the manager, you know, so. And you don't know what McDonald's saying to him either. Yeah, maybe we're just waiting to, for Kieran McDonald to come back in as a manager himself, maybe, or something like that. But yeah, like it's a... I suppose as a selector, it, it, it probably can be a frustrating role at times, like when you're involved, but you can't really make the decisions. Like it's the manager that makes the decisions. And a lot of people will say that the manager, he'll listen to you, but he'll still make his own decision and he'll do what he wants to do. Like Yeah, that's the right way too. That's the right way too. I th- which manager was I talking to when I was asking about team meetings? And like, I mean, you've got your idea of a team and three selectors come in with their idea of a team and yeah. you're outvoted on your own team. Mm. I guess madness. I it think just if the manager is the boss man now, he, yeah. he won't be out. Well, I think that was the answer to what I, I can't, it could have been Pillar. Who, which, which manager was it? I can't really remember. Anyways, finishing up, lads, before we get in, into Zach, is Connor Myler, a very interesting character, um, Lee. And I don't think too many people around the country knew how obsessive he was. You know, didn't didn't know too much how how you know he was just so dedicated to it that he didn't really think about anything else. And it wasn't until he had a look in the mirror and kind of took a step back from that obsession you know he did a PhD and he stopped obsessing about things and kind of got comfortable in his own skin and he seems to be a very deep thinker and kind of thought about what player he was and accepted the player he was you know that he ends up he'll probably be shortlisted for player of the year this year yeah I mean like his qualities were always really obvious from a Tyrone um, point of view and as a fan uh, he was always like incredibly fit. I, I interviewed Matty Donnelly once before and he told me that there, there's fitness and then there's Connor Mailer, you know, he's like <laughs> stratospheric levels of fitness, like it's meant to be uh, insane. So, I mean, and Mickey Hart always picked him as well, you know, and then when uh, Brian Durham for Logan came in, you know, his his place in the team was never in doubt and you look at the competition there. So, I mean, they're seeing something in training all of the time. Um, It could just be one of them players. I was once told that, uh, Lee, I can actually hear you thinking you know, because like he's just like clearly frazzled himself and 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 overthinking, over preparing, because it's a real thing. If you can't switch on, then you're not going to be the best version of yourself. Um, in terms of doing what he can do now, actually taking that step back and allowing his football to do the talking, 
like you say, being comfortable in his own skin. He keeps saying the word authentic um, yeah. in all of his interviews. He was just like, my big thing this year was just about being authentic, being myself and not trying to be a different sort of footballer or a different sort of leader and um, bringing my qualities to the game, knowing what my qualities are uh, and being totally happy with that. And it, it seems to have like given him a new lease of life. And he, he also talked about, um, you know, man marking the Ryan McHugh's, the Mechanespies, but not being completely married to that to actually offer some bit of a threat as well. And he's trying to find that in his game. He was talking about overthinking things. He says, I think it's been huge for me not thinking as much. Finding the zone where you're not thinking as much. You face a man up one versus one and all year I've been backing myself. I've been sidestepping men. I've been going at ease because I have a wee bit more faith in myself and accepting whatever happens, happens. And then he goes on. Even that on authenticity of understanding yourself, accepting yourself. I am who I am and this is how I play. I'm detailed, I'm diligent, I'm intense sometimes, but I think a lot of high performers are. Jesus, I would not, like, you obviously think about what kind of player you are. I think he's basically accepting the fact that he's always going to be a man marker. Accepting that, but also, you know, trying to free himself of that, you know, a little bit. Yeah, like, I think he is... He's one of these players, he's put so much into it that he's, as Lee said, he's nearly frazzled himself with it in the past. Like, and it's probably something that a lot of players can learn from. Like when you're do- putting in all this work, when you're doing all the gym work, practicing yourself, that you can just, like, it's in the bank. Like you can relax now when you're out and playing, like, and just l- express yourself. Like, yeah. And um, like, I know he, there was one quote that stood out to me from that interview. He said that, he'd done hours and hours of watching other teams and watching other games and he was putting notes in the in the Tyrone WhatsApp and listening to podcasts. Hopefully it was this podcast, <laughs> Wooly. But like it just goes to show you like how serious that he, he takes his GAA like and um it's one thing you'd notice about the Tyrone players. I just find that they're they just strike you as the most committed bunch you could you could ever see like from a gym perspective even the way they all s- score these marvelous points you know that those lads have been down in the field like getting their shooting absolutely spot on so that they can do that like yeah exactly like i mean i do think analyzing what am i as a player in this position what's my job what do i want it to be and thinking about that is very important i, I remember when i went from wing back to wing forward i've said this on the show before i'd watch paul galvin playing wing forward he's someone I admired playing wing forward and he's going in diving on breaks winning them and I was terrible at breaks and I went right well I can't be like Paul Galvin and then you look at Brian Dewar who's another fella I massively admired and the engine of him going back working and tackling I was like Jesus yeah I, I don't think I'm going to be that either but what am I going to be how will I play this role I always admired Graham Garrity as, a, as, a, as an attacking wing forward so I just decided when everyone was going in for the breaks I'd hold the half forward line I wouldn't bother going in Generally, your wing back won't go in and leave you there. So now I had the whole half forward line to myself to run left and right. And I went, geez, this is a fantastic little role of kind of, you know, you almost have to kind of uh, analyse your own strengths and weaknesses, Lee, if you're not getting enough direction from the manager, that is, and thinking, I'm sure that's what Conor Myler's doing. Like, I mean, Rook, I'm a good man marker, um, but I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't want to be just that. Yeah, I think... I think what really bothered him was in 2019, he had such a good season. You know, he was marking all these players and he was doing really, really well. Drone got to the all Ireland semi-final um, uh, against Kerry and he was having a fantastic season, but he wasn't getting anywhere near the plot as he's getting now. That's because he was just down as this man marker who's like, do you know these players, like, there's phrases that go around and there can be a bit demeaning, like uh, someone who can do a job, that's one, yeah, yeah. you know, or some, you know, who can plug a hole, things like that, you know, and it's not really uh, justifying, like, yeah, you don't want to be, you don't want to be know, described as, as either of those things. No, exactly, exactly. Um, so I think that like irked him a little bit and he got a bit obsessive about it or whatever. So now, like, like you say, he's accepting that he's a man marker, but he's also, he knows he can bring so much more so he is bringing more you know and he's like what else can i add to this game and how can i fit it in to this role rather than being i'm not just a man marker and then resisting that you know accepting that as his, as his job uh, primarily but then what else can i offer and when are the best uh, opportunities to offer those like i mean even his pass until cattle machine that day I and mean, it's not something you would have really seen too much of him you know like a big i'd say the boot ball yeah pinpoint accuracy really i mean you could say that it was just thrown into the mixer but really, that was one v2 and it fell straight to cahill 
Yeah, exactly. So he's definitely added uh, that little bit. Another thing he's doing, and I'm glad I've got you two millennials on the show here who are a lot younger than me. You can explain. So he says this is, uh, he was talking about sweat and courage or two buzzwords and uh, two obvious buzzwords for him, the way he plays. He said, sometimes I would have wrote that on my wrist before games is sweat and courage. That's all you have. Just go out there and work as hard as you can. Now, I say sweat and courage. I can remember them. I don't need to write them on my wrist to remember sweat and courage, right? So I'm in a match and I'm thinking, right, I'm, I'm faltering a little bit. What are my words? What were they? Sweat and courage. Is he writing those on his wrist to for, in case he forgets these, Niall? Do you write things on your wrists? And where has this phenomenon... It's come from sports psychology. But I see lads even in the Portuguese dressing room when I was finishing up and Jesus, like an, a piece of art. There's so much crap on these white wristbands. What's going on here? This is almost a fashion thing or a fad um, at this stage, is it? Well, Wooly, when you're playing your next Masters football match, <laughs> I think you need to write something on your wrist here. Just to remind you. <laughs> I'm still a young man. Yeah, no, it's not something that I've... I, I know we've, we've been told to do it before, to maybe write something on your hurl, like work or something like this, but it's just... Oh, sure, hurlers can do it on their hurl, Exactly, right? you have so much options, like, but um, no, I've never... Like, is I that never, why they write their names under hurls in case, <laughs> just, in case someone asks them? Yeah, no, but I've never, um, I've never really found myself in the middle match, right, looking for, looking around for the ball, and you look down at your wrist. Oh, I better start working now. Do you know, I, I think it's probably the type of thing where, well, in my head, if if you're not going to be working hard enough without seeing something wrote on your wrist, you're not really in, in a very good place. Like, but, but uh, that, hang on now, but they're my thoughts exactly. But this is Connor Myler, who is one of the hardest working fit a freak of fitness and he's doing it mm, he's an All-Ireland winner so I can't, I, yeah. I can't really talk now Lee can you throw any light on this I can yeah I actually can because um, I'm a nerd like this um, <laughs> so it's all actually came from do you ever hear the book called The Chimp Paradox yeah by Steve Peters Dr. Steve Peters um, so football teams have been using this especially Pat Gilroy in particular in 2009 with Dublin and um, so it's all about Basically, it's saying your brain is two parts. It's got an emotional part and a rational part, and the emotional part is the is the chimp. And it um, it's a, it's so it was really helpful when we were cavemen, and like it, it, it initiates your flight or fight. Um, but now we're all civilized and we're not in that much danger all the time. But it can't tell the difference when you're in a football match. So that's why people who are really like civilized and placid in civilization, but when they're in uh, a football match, they're swinging punches and getting sent off, or they've spent their entire lives kicking points. But there's one day and in one match. When the cornerbacks in your year, you just can't kick to save the life, save your life, you know, even though you've been doing it your entire life. So this happened to Dublin in 2009. Kerry um, hammered them out of the blue, like a, no one was expecting such a hammering. Yeah. Pat Gillery said they were startled earwigs, and he said that uh, they were emotionally hijacked. So he read that book and he got sports psychologists in, and then the whole thing was all about they're thinking of the outside and they need to become present again. So they all came up with what's called triggers or resets. Um, like some Dublin players, they would lift a blade of grass and then throw it away because that's that one gone, that's that mistake gone. Bernard Brogan, he would click his fingers. So if he missed a free kick, he would click his fingers, divert the energy elsewhere. Like that's the principle of it. And then it's evolved again now where they just they put tape on their hands and you write something that's meant to strike a chord with you, like in particular. It's not really meant to make sense to other people. So Connor Glass has just the word reset on his on his wrist. So if he was to uh, miss a point, he, he looks at both his feet and then he looks at his wrist, reset. And then he goes again. The idea is to bring you back to the present. Now, for me, it's um, like it's for the one percenters. Yeah. I could take myself head to toe and write, Lee, don't be in Egypt. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to kick it over the bar. But, you know, I've got two left feet at the end of the day. You know, it's the prince. But when you're Conor Mailer and you're that fit and you're that good at football, but you want to push on because you've plateaued a little bit, maybe that's just that little bit of extra thing. You know, it's not the reason he won an All-Ireland, but it's just that little, it took his game if he believes it took his game to a new level, then it did, you know, because if it works for him. But that's that's the thinking behind it. Yeah, it's all these cheese. I definitely should have come to Lee before you, Niall, on that answer. And, and me, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Lee, Lee is coming across as a much younger man than me here with it, with what he's coming out with. What was I going to say, Lee? I'm so, Gen Z. You're a millennial. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I mean, the, 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 the reality of this, I, I would have thought, though, I don't know. I, I can see the theory behind it, but these are intelligent fellas, right? And I can understand getting caught up in the emotion of the game. You can't bring yourself back without looking at something or, you know, you can't go, right, that's gone. Uh, you know, you, that players need that trigger or, I don't know. Like, I mean, 
I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just too old for it. That I, How did I survive without these bloody, uh, you know, I, is it when the red mist comes down and you've become way too emotional or, or would it be just after missing a point, Lee? Like, is it, is it, it was just simple things like missing a point. You need a, you need a, to click back into reality. Surely it's, it's not that uh, mundane. Yeah, well, I think it's it's not so much just missing one point. It's because if you miss one, that can lead to you. God, I really should have scored that. Like, if you look at Ian O'Shea at the start of that Dublin game in the semi-final, he missed that. Was it a mark? I mean, like, he should be hitting that all day, every day. Um, so and then it, so he had he, a bad game after. If he clicked his fingers after that... Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, gonna I'm, be, I'm not defending I'm, the principle. I'm, no, I'm, I'm just being a dickhead now, <laughs> um, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> but th- that's the theory. It's it's to stop you from letting it snowball rather than letting it snowball and then it being too late to come out of that sort of that sort of frame of mind. Yeah. I I always have huge admir- admir- admiration for golfers who could tree put from like about six foot on a hole and if that was me like I mean you know the club would be thrown into a, a lake or whatever that they walk onto the next tee box now if none of these triggers they might just walk to the tee box chatting with their caddy and all of a sudden they stand up and that's completely forgotten about I was go, how are they so calm you know how are they not enraged maybe it's training themselves uh, to do maybe that's the maybe maybe they've got something written somewhere under bag and they bring themselves back into it I don't know listen I'll stop talking about it because <laughs> I'm talking total waffle about it we'll come back and we'll talk some sense with Zach who he next Alright so he's just finished his 11th season in the AFL and as we know he's the second in the all time appearances in the AFL for an Irish player it's Zach Tuhi Port Leash man welcome back to the show Zach Yeah Willie thanks for having me No hassle at all I have to start with the biggest news of the week and that is that there was a bloody earthquake um, in Melbourne on Tuesday what the hell is going on? Yeah, cap off what's been a fantastic couple of weeks for me. Got absolutely <laughs> flogged in our semi final, and then the world is falling apart here. I don't know. We were sat in the house, and the, the whole place just started shaking. It's the second time I've ever felt a little tremor, and uh, yeah, not comfortable. Right. So this is never. This I was reading. This hasn't happened in two hundred years or something in Melbourne. This is like. Were you given no. a warning about it or? No, 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 out of nowhere. Uh, I just out of nowhere. Um, it was in New Zealand. I was over there for a game a few years back and I felt one there too. And uh, I only got the very sort of minor experience, but it's pretty daunting. Jesus, yeah. Well, like, did the plates fall out of the, the cupboards or anything like that? Or it's just a bit of a, a shake? Nah, we only got a bit of a shake. We were kind of on the periphery of where the epicenter was, I suppose. Um, right. It was a few hundred kilometers inland. But I think some places caught a fair bit of damage. I've seen some walls did come down in Melbourne and some of the buildings there. So nothing crazy, but there's damage. Right, OK. Um, 5.9 or something like that. Anyways, I'll leave earthquakes now. I'm going to move on to pandemics now uh, when we're talking about disasters. Uh, what, what the hell's going on over in Australia, Zach? Like, it feels that, I don't know, you're kind of where we were a year ago out there now. So I think early stages, we were doing quite well when there was no real vaccines getting around. Um, Australia is obviously able to separate the cities quite well because it's so big, so you can limit flights and stuff. So it seemed like it was under control. But since vaccines have come in, the rest of the world has passed us by. So um, I'm not sure what percent we're at, but not much better than half the population is vaccinated. And um, we're getting spikes every other week. So snap lockdowns. And that's the thing. So whenever there's one case, there's a snap lockdown. I was reading your first game, it was your second game. You missed the first game. It was against Brisbane at home and you were playing Brisbane and they travelled down to play you and a few minutes before the ball was bounced, it came out that there was a case discovered in Brisbane and your health authority said no one can come in from Brisbane but the Brisbane team had already come in and the game, the game was nearly called off. Well, yeah, I remember that. So obviously the players were allowed to play but anyone who travelled from Brisbane to watch the game um, were told basically at the stadium that they had to turn around and go back to the hotel and get on a flight straight back. And there was even a case this year of uh, GWS um, in the warm-up. Literally, they were warming up on the ground to go out and the health authorities came and told a couple of the players that they're they're going because they've been to hot spots. So it's just crazy. But it's the world. It's the way the world's been for a couple of years. Um, fingers crossed next year gets back to semi-normality because... Drive you demented. Yeah. And I think, was your family supposed to come out and they can't come out? Like, you couldn't have them holed up in a hotel or in a, you know, one of these, they're pretty much detention centres, aren't they? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a couple of weeks not leaving your room in a hotel, but practically speaking, you can't even get people, you know, for the most part, you just wouldn't be allowed entry. 
Um, obviously, it would have been nice to get my family out last year. We made the grand final. It didn't quite work out, but it would have been nice if they were here. But just practically speaking, it's it's not doable. Um, it's quite difficult to move between states in Australia at the minute, much less uh, countries. Right. So your game against Melbourne, obviously because of the whole COVID thing, and these big games are always in Melbourne. Like That's where all the teams are, and you have to travel to Perth to get 60,000. Obviously, things are going well. Um, over in Perth so like I mean that's an unusual thing the grand final was played out there as well last year I'm pretty sure yeah the or grand final year. was up in Brisbane last year yeah it was up in Brisbane last year and it's obviously in Perth this year but I, I think it's been a hundred and something years prior to that that it wasn't played at the MCG so unique conditions but the states are so um, easily separated as I said and, and WA where Perth is um, were pretty stringent on who they allowed in so when the rest of the country was falling apart, their numbers weren't too bad. Um, so they opened their doors eventually, and that's where the final series is being played. So I'm going to have to ask you about the, the Melbourne game. So obviously, I'll talk to you about last year's grand final in a minute. But, like, I mean, this was a bit of a shock loss. The, the manner of the loss, 125 to 42. Like, I mean, you're one of the favourites. Um, you're coming off a great mm-hmm. win in the, whatever, the quarterfinals uh, the week before. And just a total collapse then in the semi final. Um, there was a there was a there was a smell of this during the year. The league's as close as it's ever been. Typically in the AFL, there's always been any given year there tends to be one standout team, and then maybe they get pipped on the day. This year, you could argue there was probably four or five teams that there's virtually nothing between any of them. Um, and there was a few of those anomalous results where any one of those good teams would lose in spectacular fashion right throughout the year. Unfortunately for us, <laughs> that came in the preliminary final or our semi final. Um, and it's just hard to stop. Like, it's like any sport. Well, you know, it's yeah. like when a team gets a run on, it's hard to stop momentum in game. And in AFL, you're just craving like quarter time breaks and half time breaks because the pitch is too big to, to stop teams that have momentum. Well, that's the thing. You can't get messages in, I presume. Like we saw it even this year in, in the GEA. Tyrone got destroyed by Kerry. They're almost freak results, Zach, where, where you, you almost can't analyze them. You almost, I don't know, how, how do you deal with, with the likes of that? Yeah, I've played in plenty of games in the past where you can lose in such spectacular fashion that honestly the best way to coach it is to sweep it under the carpet and move on, right. which is so anti, like it's obviously um, sounds wrong. But the truth is you get these anomalous results every now and then. Now, unfortunately, the nature of this one is I'm sure we'll look at it fairly thoroughly when we come back next year, but it just happens. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, it happened to us at, Jesus, the most inopportune time. Yeah, in the in the semi final, because obviously expectations were high. Like you're one of the favourites. Like you said, there'll be four or five teams probably in that in that same boat. So that you lo- lose that final, couple of days drinking, and then you're pretty much on your holidays till it, it it all ends very quickly, I presume. Yeah, yeah, it still is a bit of a shock to the system. We talk about this as players: is you lose a game on a Saturday, you'll have a get together on a Sunday, and by Monday, Tuesday, we flew back from Perth to Melbourne, and I kind of won't see, you know, a lot of the guys for twelve weeks. Um, that's just the nature of it here. You sometimes forget how much of a business it is. Um, yeah. You know, we've had a big turnover in our coaching panel already. Three or four coaches have left. Uh, a few players will end up leaving. And, and the reality is that at the end of every season, you'll never get that group of players back together again. So it's abrupt and it happens quick and you just have to move on. And like, do you think about that? Like, I mean, is getting over a loss like that or even the grand final uh, last year as a professional, you have to just tell yourself, look, that's a job. I'm back home now and I'm not going to, you know, it, 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 do, you, do you talk yeah. about it as professionals to say, here, look, you have to put that to one side rather than let it, you know, I th- think maybe GEA would get on top of you for a few weeks afterwards. No, I'm not. I'm really not um, an expert in this space. Now, as a senior player, when you're around the group, your job is to kind of move on and keep standards high and drive training and all those lovely things that we like to talk about. Um, but the truth is the older I get, the harder I'm finding it. And I'm pretty open about the fact that like f- for a few days post game, I would much rather just sit in my room and not talk to anyone. That's probably not, um, the best thing to do as a quote unquote leader, given my age now, but I've no interest in mixing with anyone. I don't want to celebrate the year that's been. I just want to cl- climb in a hole and the older I get and the older I'm getting and the fewer chances that I know I'm going to have it, um, the harder it's getting. So um you come around after a little while i mean it is just a game as they say but it's not getting any easier and i'm actually finding it way more challenging than i used to to forget about these losses and move on so uh, maybe not an authority on this 
on this particular subject. Yeah, and I suppose going into a room and not talking to anyone isn't great when you're a father either. Like, I mean, no matter how much you want to do it. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm wrong on both counts. Like, it was, it's objectively a better decision to just go and hang out with the lads, um, which I did do, but uh, it ain't getting easier. Um, I'm getting sore. I'm getting older. I'm going to have fewer shots at it. Um, and you tend to take it pretty personally when you're now... I'm at a stage in my career where I see myself as one of the more senior experienced guys that needs to stand up. And every time you don't stand up, it's hard not feel like it's your fault. The, like, I mean, you mentioned that you're older, like you'd had two injuries this year. You had a back problem, missed the first game, and then you had a hamstring problem. Your first ever hamstring problem, like a complete freak you are when it mm. comes to injuries. Like, I mean, is that, are you starting to feel it? Yeah, I am starting to feel it a bit, Willie. Um, like, look, I've had a really good run. I've never had any significant injury in my career right up until the end of 2018 when I hurt my knee. Um, but even then, I only missed kind of a handful of games across the next two years. Um, the hamstring was a total anomaly again. There was no signs. And it was only a minor hamstring. But again, I haven't done one in you know my entire career. Um, I'm, I am um, taking me a little bit longer to recover than it used to. But that's the name of the game. I felt I felt like I was met out Kevlar till I was 27. Um and they all tell you that that's what happens, but uh, it's a tough game. Um, I've been here 11 or 12 years now, and it is starting to catch up on me, but surely have enough left in the tank to go home and play for Port Leash, which is becoming the priority. Yeah, well, we need you. There's no doubt about that. Badly, badly needed. So, the, like, I mean, I'll get to the plan um, in a minute. But, like, I mean, I, w- I was reading that in the quarterfinals, sorry, I'm not good with all these preliminary finals and all these things. So, like, pretty much in the grand quarterfinal, like, you had your best stats in your entire career. Um, with disposals mm-hmm. and assists and all these things and your manager was saying like uh, incredible performances yeah. like when you're performing that well at that high level like I mean I know your plan is to come home like w- would you try and negotiate another extended year or something like that? Yeah I think I'll probably stay as long as I can well, yeah. to be honest like if I've got next year contracted if I can get another one or two after that I'll probably take it Yeah. Um, and I, although I said I am slowing down and recovering a bit slower I am also playing um as good as I've ever played, it just means I've had to learn to um, adapt my week in the build-up to games. I don't train every session. I don't, you know, a bit more of a focus on recovery during the week than, than training. Um, so my performances haven't really suffered, but I'm just uh, aware of my own mortality um, at this stage of your career. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take every year they give me. I still love playing out here. I think it's an awesome game. I'm very grateful to be able to have played as long as I have. And I'm pretty confident that however long I do play here, I'll be able to have enough in the tank post-career, but for back home. I, I think the last time I was talking to you, we were talking about how you're, you know, playing in different positions. So you used to be, you know, a defender and now you're playing on the wing and I think you're playing in the forward as well. And that's continued on this year. Like, are you moving around within a game or are you just being given a different role at, you know, at the start of a game? No, it happens within games. Um, and, which is, is good for me. I've been a career defender. I played half back for 10 years and then um, fairly inexplicably, they put me on the wing kind of halfway through last year and it worked really well. Um, and what it means is we've got a lot of really good players that can play in the midfield um, and not many of those guys tend to rotate in the back half. So it allows me to spend half a quarter in the midfield, the other half down back. And, and if I have to pinch hit up forward, I can do it. Um, the benefit as an older player with being able to do that is that it adds another... Um, you know, I can basically cover most positions on the ground now. Um, so I think coaches like having that versatility in the side should a player get injured, which has happened a few times this year. I've been told I was doing one thing all week and then five minutes into a game, it's been changed. Right. But like, I mean, is that is that unique in the AFL to be able to do that? It wouldn't be totally unique in Gaelic football. Like, I mean, Gaelic football, you were the very same. You play wing back, centre forward, full forward. It wouldn't make any difference to your wing forward. Is it unique in AFL to have that adaptability? I think most teams have one or two players who can do it. But generally speaking, players are career position players and it doesn't change very often. Um, I think one of the things I noticed with the game when I first came out, I might have said it to you before, is uh, it's incredibly structured. And, and by all accounts, GA has really caught up to it in that in that regard. Um, but like, there's a huge, really huge difference between playing half forward and playing on the wing. And there's a big difference between playing on the wing and playing half back in terms of where you're supposed to position yourself. Um, and it took me a long time to feel comfortable playing down back, so I wasn't keen to change it. But uh, 10 years in, um, yeah, I feel like I've got a pretty good grasp on a few different positions now. Yeah, without knowing much about AFL, because I don't, but like you'd imagine your kicking ability 
some position in the forwards as you get older would be a good, you know, if you can mark it at all, you're going to score from distance. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. Like, I probably see, I probably see myself as being most damaging kind of across that half forward line, but not almost as a goal scorer. No. Um, more as somebody delivering it inside 50. Um, again, like, you could argue if you, you could argue you're better off having your best kicks in the back half because that's where all attacks start from. But um, if I could pinch hit a couple of years in the forward line, Jesus, I'd do it. Yeah, you'd absolutely do it. You're not chasing around anyone. I wanted to ask you about the grand final because Aaron Aaron Kernan was on the show. I didn't I didn't know this. So before the grand final, there's called the the People's Parade, where the two teams almost like is it like I'm think picturing St Patrick's Day parade with a band and you're going through the streets and like I mean. This is the Friday before the game, which is, would be on the Saturday or the Sunday. Like, explain to us what this is like. Well, we because because of, of COVID, we actually last year was the first year it didn't happen. Oh no! Thankfully, oh, but thank it, you. You, you're pretty spot on. It's uh, it's like a St Patrick's Day parade. You pair up in the back of trucks and uh, drive you around town, and you wave and you, I don't know, fire lollipops at kids or something. I'm not really too sure, but it is part of the build up and. Um, We've often been warned in the build-up to like semi-finals and that that if you do win it, um, it's going to be a strange build-up to the biggest game of your life because um, yeah, that's hardly ideal prep, is it? Like honestly, no. But like you're obviously contracted to do it to promote the final, right? So it's mm. something that it's. I, I'd say obviously you're not looking forward to it as a player throw lollies in the day be- the day before or whatever. But at the same time, <laughs> it does create the buzz in that in the city and. I don't know. I feel sometimes the GEA is a little bit behind that thing of making a big... For example, I was given out this year, Mayo did their press day before the All-Ireland final, a month before the final, and they put one player up in the manager. Like, no promotion, really. You mm. know, whereas, obviously, you're professionals and you're contracted to promote, the, to promote a big final like that. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that maybe we shouldn't undersell is that in Australia, there's huge competition... Um, for viewership and that because there's a lot of sports competing against each other so obviously in certain parts of australia rugby league is the biggest cricket's huge they've got like pro tennis pro soccer basketball they've got everything so i'm not sure there's the same competition for viewership back home so it's almost the case of well if you don't have to do it why would you do it um they don't have that luxury here so they need to build it up because if they don't build it up you might lose you know x amount of thousands of viewers to the nrl grand final which is in a couple of weeks so it's um, probably born out of necessity more than anything, but they do it very well. Right. And like I'm thinking even the, the Super Bowl, like what's media access like? Are you contracted to have to do media right up until the, the final as well? I think the AFL does um, access to players and clubs particularly well. Now, obviously, you don't know what it's like anywhere else in the world, but there's constantly cameras in most clubs most of the time. Um, and you, you're not particularly contracted to do X amount of media appearances um but it is expected that certain media outlets have access to training and to games and stuff and to be honest like it's a pretty powerful tool if you're a club there's no reason not to let the cameras in because provided you're doing things right you come out with smelling great and i think um most clubs here see the benefit in it right and it's just something you get used to as a player you just pay no notice to it after a while i presume yeah after a little while but like they don't just put anyone up like it's more the players who are comfortable doing it and um, you might occasionally get one of the young guys who, who have to front the media, but nine of every 10 media commitments are done by guys who've been around for a long time. Right, right. OK. And um, just on the playing side as well, um, the last time we spoke, we talked about the game in Australia going a little bit defensive and a little bit like, you know, Gaelic football. And Gaelic football's coming out of it a little bit more. We're seeing more kicking and Tyrone going along with their kickouts. And I think the wheel is turning. What, what's it like out there? You, you mentioned that it's still a pretty structured game. It's still highly structured. I think maybe one thing that's helped is Richmond, who have been particularly successful in the last few years, tended to play a much more manic style, uh, much more high risk style. Um, and you know, once once one team has success, what yeah. tends to happen is other, th- other teams follow suit. Um, so they've changed some rules to try and like free up the game. They've limited the rotations, so players are basically more fatigued than they would have been in previous years, in the hopes that that fatigue will mean there's not as much running and there's more space and stuff like that. So they've tinkered with the rules. Um, but yeah, it, it, I've always thought it was a pretty good spectacle and I've always felt the way for the most part about GA as well. Um, but yeah, that's just me. They, they, so they've limited substitution. So say the, the, you can't keep tracking up and down the field and helping the defence and dropping players back. Is that it? 
Yeah, so it used to be the case that you could rotate players as often as you like. Um, you just run on and off as, as often as you like, as long as there was always the right amount of people on the ground. So some teams are getting up to 150 rotations a game. So you might come on for four or five minutes, get off, come on for four or five minutes, get off. And it just meant players were fresh and it was really intense and there was a lot of tackling and just a lot of scrum work, basically. Uh, okay. Their logic is that if players are more fatigued, um, they won't be able to run as hard and spread as hard and skills might even drop off a bit, but it will be higher scoring. Um, I don't know if the numbers back that up or not. Um, I think the counter argument would be if you're going to make players play a game that's two hours long and expect them to cover 14, 15 Ks and don't give them a break, there's a really good chance they'll break down. Um, again, I'm not sure if that's been the case either, but um, yeah, that's what, and they're, they're actually talking about shortening it again. So they dropped it to 90 rotations um, a game and I think they're talking about dropping it even further. Right, okay. That's, in, that's d- definitely interesting. So when do you go back into contract negotiations then? We, obviously next year is your, your last year, your 12th year, mm. Um, as a full-time professional. So what, what happens from here? Like, Yeah, contracts. So you can do your contract any time of year. Um, typically, how it works is the way to the back end of your current contract. Um, and they'll discuss it then. Like, I'm in a position now where realistically, I'll take another year or two if I can get it. I don't expect that to happen in the next six or eight months. Um, and if it doesn't happen at all, that's that's fine. I think I've had a pretty good run. Um, but ideally you'd like to know by the halfway mark of the year where you're at. And, right. and to be honest, even if you don't know for sure where you're at, I think most players can, can feel out the club pretty quickly and, and get an idea as to whether or not they're going to kick on again. Is it, un- is it usual for, t- you'll be 30, you'll be 33 at the end of your contract. Do 33 year olds get extensions yeah. to do get them? It happens. Yeah, yeah, it happens. But it's kind of like, well, it's probably like most sports really. Like, um, you're not going to give a, a 32 or 33 year old a, a four year contract no. <laughs> extension. Um, it's just the way it works. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of guys that age trotting about, but they're all trotting about on one year contracts, which is kind of what I expect to be coming for me. Um, hopefully at the end of the year. Yeah. Well, you're making plans anyways for when you finish. Um, you've opened up a sandwich. How would you describe it? A sandwich bar and a, and a cafe, the Wandering Elk in Port Leash. And it's a rip roaring success. And I know a lot about this place because my Mrs. Itzy works in it. Um, it was supposed to be a part time job, but it's a lot more than part time. I might have a bone <laughs> to pick with you. <laughs> with you. <laughs> yeah, well, we knew she'd be a hard worker having to put up with you. So we figured she'd have. Um... <laughs> work ethic wouldn't be an issue um no it's uh yeah the wandering out cafe in port leash it's uh i guess um melbourne-esque was that was the kind of the goal and it seems to have taken off people really like it obviously it's got our instagram there and you can jump on and, and get a pretty good feel for what the the caliber of food is like but um yeah man, it's been it's been really exciting it's what i've wanted to do post-career for a very long time was get into coffee um it's world-class coffee out here. It's one thing they do better than anywhere else in the world. So to, to try and bring it home was pretty, was pretty good fun. Yeah, definitely. And a huge markup on coffee too, which you've, I'm sure you know, which is a fantastic <laughs> element of, <laughs> of coffee. The sandwiches are, are yeah. absolutely, they're sensational. You're, are you, you're, you're actually extending already. And is Murray, your business partner, talking about opening up another one in another town? So like, I mean, this, you know, this could grow. It could grow. Yeah, that's the plan. It's been open for, I don't know, 17 or 18 weeks. Um, and we have had to extend next door because the, the kind of support has been outrageous. Um, and there is aspirations to move to other towns in the Midlands. I think we will sooner rather than later. Um, but it's just been, man, it's been, it's been excellent. And fortunately, we have gotten some fantastic people in the door working for us, as you already touched on. We're pretty lucky with the, the staff we've gotten. Um, and the support around town, but post career, uh, that's probably it for me. That's that's what I want to do is try and grow the elk. That that's the important. Like I suppose, like I mean, you worry when you're going into your last year about what you're going to do. So I'm sure when that has taken off, you know, and is going so well, you'll obviously have to keep you know keep it going. But like I mean, at least it it gives you some sort of direction rather than I'm sure you're worried as in what the hell am I going to do here in a couple of years time? Yeah, I did have a little mini sort of um midlife crisis a couple of years ago like when i was coming to the end of my last contract and i was sort of thinking geez if this is my last contract i I better get my ducks in a row fortunately for me um this has gone really well um i've got next year and i'm kind of working on the assumption that um if next year is it for me uh all my eggs are in this basket and hopefully i'll end up back home and doing a bit of media and a bit of cafe work and a bit of 
football that's the plan perfect perfect and another thing when Itzy's in there a lot more than part time I'm at home minding children and I can't go anywhere so that'll make you even happier Zach this is like a this is like a, a double yeah. win from you, for you <laughs> We're only open Wednesday to Sunday. If you want, we can open Monday and Tuesday as well. <laughs> I'll pass on that. Zach, come here. Thanks very much for, for taking a call and joining the show again. Pleasure. Thanks, Bully. All right. Great stuff from Zach there. Right. We're, that's all we have time for today. We'll be back on Monday as usual and review all the weekend's action. So we'll talk to you all then. Good luck. <laughs>